Hello, my name is Dr. Allie Baumgartner and I am the Paleontology Collections Manager here at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. And though my day job I take care of dead animals, today I'm going to be talking to you about something a little bit closer to my heart, plants. Today we're going to be talking about ferns. So ferns are the other group of vascular plants. If I were to ask you to envision a plant, it would more than likely be an angiosperm. So those are the flowering, fruiting plants. And honestly, if you're living in a temperate or equatorial region, that's the kind of plants that you're seeing mostly around you. If you're living a little bit th uh, further north or you're getting into maybe the uh, Christmas season, then you might start thinking of gymnosperms. So those are the cone-bearing plants. Those are the two major groups of seed-bearing vascular plants. The trees, those are the ones that everyone thinks of. But the OG vascular plant is the fern. So ferns are a member of the group of pteridophytes that includes um, horsetails and lycophytes. And I'm not going to be talking about the, the other two groups today. Today we're just going to be focusing on ferns. You're probably familiar with ferns. They're not uncommon. Uh, they're, today they're mostly found in wetter regions. I can tell you right now, we don't really have a lot of ferns here in Kansas. It's a little too uh, hot and dry for that. And the reason that ferns are still tied to these wetter regions in ways that we don't see with gymnosperms or angiosperms is because of their reproduction. So let's go over what is a fern. So a fern, I have my handy dandy uh, reference, so you don't have to envision. This is a fern. So ferns are vascular. That means that they have tubes inside them that can um, move nutrients and water. It also provides them with some structural support. So in some parts of the world, uh, there are tree ferns. And they're not necessarily trees the way that you would expect like a uh, pine or a maple to be, but they could be really big, much bigger than the types of ferns we have here in, say, North America. So they don't tend to have big um, woody trunks, but they have um, very large leaves. So this is a fern from South Dakota, uh, Dropterus, and you can see that if this were unfolded, this would be a pretty big leaf. And some of them can get easily three to five feet long. Um, so that would be about 90 to 150 uh, centimeters. So pretty big. The main difference though, between uh, ferns and seed plants is that these are spore bearing. And so if we look really close, if you look at the underside of these, uh, of these leaves, you see all of these little brown dots. And those are the sori. That's where the spores come out of. So these don't make seeds, they don't make fruit, they just disperse their spores. So one of the major uh, other differences between ferns and other kinds of vascular plants is that we're gonna talk about the alternations of generations. It's gonna be okay, don't get scared. So people tend to get really nervous <laughs> when you mention uh, alternation of generations. It's one of the reasons that people think that plants are scary or hard to understand. And they're not, we're gonna be brave. So alternation of generations simply means that there are two different life forms, life stages in plants, the sporophyte, in the gametophyte. So what that means is there is the life stage that makes the spores, so the sporophyte. So the spores are going to be um, like pollen in uh, trees that you would expect. Um, and then there's the gametophyte. So that's the part that makes the gametes, so like the sperm and the egg. All right, so you got the two different life forms. The sporophyte has the whole set of, of chromosomes. So they have uh, the whole mom and dad, you know, the whole male and female set of chromosomes. The gametophyte only has half. They only have a single one or the other set of chromosomes. Sporophyte makes the spores, gametophyte makes the gametes. In ferns, both the sporophyte and the gametophyte parts of the lifestyle are free living. So you could find, you can easily find a fern that's a sporophyte. The vast majority of ferns that you see, the most common, the dominant life cycle uh, stage of 
ferns is the sporophyte phase. So that's the one I showed you. It had the stuff to make the spores. <laughs> it's definitely a sporophyte. There's also the teeny tiny little gametophyte phase. They're really neat. They're absolutely tiny. They look like little hearts. They're very cute. Um, but the gametophyte phase, which makes the gametes, which makes the eggs, which makes the sperm, um, that has to have water because the sperm have to swim through the water to get to another gametophyte. So they have to live very close together near water. And then the sporophyte will basically grow out of what was the gametophyte and the gametophyte will go away. Um, but like I said, ferns are pretty common in a lot of parts of the world. You can find them particularly in like the Eastern uh, deciduous forests of North America. In many parts of the world, people will actually eat uh, ferns. They will eat the part that's called a fiddlehead. So the way that these leaves will unfurl, unfortunately, I don't have a good example to hold up for you, but the way that you uh, can get this tiny, or excuse me, this huge leaf to grow out of a tiny uh, spot in the ground is by forming a fiddle head, a fiddle head. So basically this would all roll back up like rolling up your sleeping bag to make it <laughs> fit into a smaller space. And that process of unfurling from a fiddlehead is called circinate vernation, which is one of my favorite terms in botany. Um, so those fiddleheads are actually edible in many parts of the world. Don't forage for fiddleheads unless you know they're safe because many of them can be toxic. But if you do have an opportunity, I would recommend you try it. I hope to try a fiddlehead one day. Haven't had the chance yet. So of the major groups of plants that we have around today, we have the bryophytes, so the mosses and friends. We have the ferns and friends. We have the gymnosperms and we have the angiosperms. So those are the four main groups of plants. Ferns are the oldest vascular plants living on the planet today. So ferns are way older than any of the trees that we have. Ferns are some of the earliest trees uh, that we have on the planet, which is really neat because there is kind of this uh, primal feeling of going into a forest that's full of ferns. And so we have a lot of ferns in the fossil record. So here is an example of a little tiny fern fossil, maybe not that small, but not particularly big. Uh, fern fossil, this is from the latest Eocene, so approximately, oh, uh, maybe 35 million years old. It's, this is from the Florissant Formation in uh, Florissant Fossil Beds National Monument in Florissant, Colorado. We really liked the name Florissant. So as you can see, ferns have pretty much looked the same for most of the time that they've been on the planet. It's a good shape. Why change it if it ain't broke, right? I do like a fossil fern. Um, it's always nice to look at fossils and realize, yep, if I went in a time machine, I could recognize the basics. So today we have a wide variety in the kinds of shapes. So the ones that I've shown you have leaves that are uh, panatosect. So that means that they ha are highly dissected. They are um, branching in a lot of different ways. There are some kinds of ferns that are called ophioglossids, so that means adder's tongue. And so they have these thick, almost strap-like leaves that look very different from this. And they could range in size from the tree ferns that you can find in Australia or New Zealand, all the way down to azola, also known as duckweed, which is a tiny little fern that lives on the top of ponds. It might be the size of maybe a, you know, somewhere between a lentil to a, a piece of quinoa, not very big. Azola was really uh, common in the fossil record. And in fact, we have evidence of Azola blooms, blooms, they don't have flowers, but expansions in the size of the population in the Arctic. There used to be ferns growing in the Arctic in the early Cenozoic, so in the Paleocene and Eocene. It's kind of neat. I'd like to see that in the fossil record. I don't need to see that today. So I hope you enjoyed this kind of quick crash course into what it is to be a fern. If you enjoyed what you see, we have lots of videos like this. Sometimes they're about plants, sometimes they're about animals, sometimes they're about all sorts of things in between. So if you like this, subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks for joining us in a new way to museum with the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. 
you enjoyed this video, like it and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell for notifications when we release a new video. Support us on Patreon for early access and exclusive content. You can also follow us on all our social media. Links are found in the description. Thanks for watching and follow your curiosity to new discoveries.